currently allow. We are hiring. We want to, to extend our team. So we gladly invite you and everyone you know to apply for a senior product manager position, which would require um, several years of, of experience. And you could help us with all our, uh, um, to enrich in the, the portfolio and uh, obtain great results for our clients. And also we have a community manager role as, as you know, we have this large community, but we're looking to exponentially grow, which we are already doing now and we want to continue doing so. So please, you're welcome to, to apply and contact us if you want to join our team. So thank you very much. And now let's get to business. Today, we have to, the, the pleasure to talk about challenges while working on machine learning based products with our guest, Noor from Salonis. So Noor, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about such an exciting and hot topic nowadays. We're very much looking forward to the presentation. Please, you, you have the stage. Thank you so much. Mm, so I am gonna share my screen. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you so much, product people, for <laughs> inviting me. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm Noor, and uh, today I'm going to talk about how is it like working with the machine learning products, and what are the challenges, what to uh, keep into consideration. And um, I'll be talking from my experience, but before that, I can quickly introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Noor. I am working as a product manager at Salonis uh, and uh, particularly for the machine learning team at Salonis. And before that, um, I was working as a software engineer. So uh, I also studied software engineering and then big data management and analytics. So I'm coming uh, from a IT background and uh, now I am working in the product domain. Uh, so starting off, I would like to start with telling you a little bit of uh, who Salonis is, so the company where I work. Uh, so we are uh, basically started, uh, we started with the being a process mining company. Uh, what this means is, is that we were looking into and visualizing the processes of uh, different companies, processes such as order to cash, accounts payable, Etc. And uh, now uh, we have expanded to being an execution management system as well. So uh, not only find mine the processes and find the bottlenecks in the processes and see how to optimize the processes, but also uh, make sure that the operational users can use day to day uh, uh, our product to execute the tasks. So we have uh, real time data ingestion. Uh, we have built-in connectors to connect to different ERP systems and other systems such as SAP, Oracle. And then we transform this data to visualize uh, this data into processes, see what are the bottlenecks in the processes, how to optimize these uh, processes. And then we also offer uh, modules where you can uh, plan the changes, upcoming changes into your process using simulation then you can manage your day-to-day -day tasks uh, of your process. For example, clearing an invoice, opening an invoice, uh, uh, dispatching an order, et cetera. And then we also cover then automation of the process and uh, the action flow of the process. So this is uh, what we do at Salonis. And uh, we are also heavily integrating machine learning into our solutions, so such as focusing on uh, future predictions, forecast, uh, and helping the tasks um, uh, with this extra information. So uh, since we talked uh, about in the beginning that we're gonna talk about how it's like to work with machine learning products. So I uh, thought to start with just a bit of introduction of what machine learning is. Uh, um, like this is like a very uh, hyped topic, so most of the people already know what it is, but I just thought to give a quick recap. So machine learning basically is uh, solving complex problems using algorithms 
that are uh, using data and uh, learning over time through the experience and through the data. And this could be as simple as a decision tree, uh, which means that just creating a tree from the history of the data and then for the future database on the branches of that tree, you make the decisions or it could be as complex as neural networks that is trying to um, simulate how, how a human brain works and uh, make layers in, in a similar way and then try to solve similar problems or try, try to do predictions or forecast based on that model. And uh, different categories of machine learning problems are, uh, for example, doing predictions or forecast or clustering different things into groups anomaly detection, et cetera. Uh, so I am gonna start with talking about problem framing and what it means in machine learning. Uh, so first question that you have to answer when working with the machine learning uh, solutions is that, is it even a machine learning problem? So it's always that there might be some simpler uh, solutions available to bring the same value and you have to always think about it. So it's, it's not a good idea to overcomplicate uh, the solutions if there is like a simpler solution available, or uh, for example, if there is uh, a simpler way to solve the problem, then it's not a good idea just to put machine learning in it for the sake of having machine learning because it's always in the end, the question of what value you are bringing. So it's always uh, to start with, uh, a good idea to ask yourself this question that does the solution really have to be machine learning driven or can you also solve it with statist simple statistics or rule-based approaches? Uh, then uh, coming to uh, what customer wants. So in uh, when talking about machine learning problems, it's often the case that customers do not know um, what they want uh, when it comes to machine learning. So it's not so straightforward as to say that, okay, we have a machine learning team and we are now enhancing our product uh, with the machine learning uh, abilities. So what are your needs in that uh, domain? So this is not the right way to go about it. So you basically have to understand what are the problems out there with your customer and uh, with your customers and map them to what kind of solutions uh, uh, you can provide. So for example, does it need to uh, do some future forecast or does it need to detect some anomalies or um, or predictions? And if, if this, any of the customer problems can be solved with one of those uh, things. And then also uh, machine learning is this buzzword uh, right, so it's always like a good thing when something has a buzzword status because uh, there is this hype about the topic and then lots of traction, but it also has its own disadvantages because you will often hear people um, in the interviews or when you'll try to find out uh, what are the needs out there, you'll often hear people saying we need machine learning, but they don't really know why they need machine learning or what can it do. So you really have to take care of that as well. That is just uh, uh, many people are just talking about it because it's uh, it's out there and it's like good to have, not because they understand what value they can get out of it. So you have to uh, make um, this uh, clear. Uh, so oh, for example, you can use these uh, AI project canvas, uh, canvas to uh, narrow down uh, the problem. Uh, so uh, there are many different uh, formats of it, but one of them is like this one, where you clearly define, okay, what the data is there, what output are we expecting, what are the skill sets that we would need to develop the solution. Very important that what value will it add? Uh, how will this be integrated? How many customers would be using it and who would they be? Who are the main stakeholders and what would be the cost versus the revenue that you would generate from the solution? So if you split this into all these different sections to uh, list down what the problem is, it's easier to understand uh, 
how you can create the solution uh, using that information and if it's even worth developing that solution. Okay, and then um, I would also like to quickly mention that uh, one thing that we should also consider always is that when we are working with machine learning solutions, the product development life cycle is um, slightly different than the normal uh, software development life cycle, which is basically you gather the requirements, you design, you implement, test, and maintain. But when it comes to machine learning, it's highly uh, important to understand business as well as understand the data, right? So the first step uh, in when working with the machine learning products is to do a thorough business understanding and then to acquire the data that is required to solve this problem and map this data back to your business understanding, create a first pipeline and to end using the data to, to the output to uh, validate the feasibility of the solution. And from there on moving towards uh, exploring what machine learning models can you use there, how to refine them with different parameters and different inputs, uh, uh, then validate those, then uh, check for the product readiness, because when we work with machine learning problems, it tends to get heavily customer specific because with different data sets, the machine learning solutions work very differently. So you have to make sure that you get to the point where it's ready to be a product and not just uh, specific to one customer only, and then move towards de deployment and then uh, maintenance. So this is important to understand the difference in the development life cycle so that you take into account this into your timeline and into your prioritization while working uh, with something around machine learning solution. Then I would also like to talk about teams because uh, the product teams of machine learning are also slightly different. So in the machine learning teams, you are mostly working with machine learning engineers, which are different than software engineers because although it's very important in uh, while working with any product to involve the engineers from very early on in the ideation to get the most out, out of it. But when it comes to machine learning engineers, it's even more important because it's very important that the machine learning engineers in the team understand the business and the data uh, to a very good level to be able to provide the right machine learning solution to it. And this is very important to bridge the gap between, between the business and the technology so nothing gets lost in the translation. So it's very important to give your machine learning engine, uh, engineers, let's say a partial product management role as well, because um, uh, in order to get the solution right, it's very important. And then, also, it's nice to do a separation between uh, the teams for the infrastructure. So when you're working on machine learning products, you need a infrastructure to orchestrate the solution. So where will you deploy your machine learning solution? Where will the machine learning models run? How will they, hold, how will they be hosted? How will they get the input data versus how will uh, they provide the output data? So this whole infrastructure solution should be normally best developed by the software engineers because there, there you need like good software practices versus the machine learning engineers then who can focus on uh, totally machine learning models and how to make the most accurate results out of them and how to tune the model in a way that the, for example, the predictions you are doing or the anomalies that you are detecting are uh, as accurate as it can get. And then, um, and then the UX, um, uh, team to focus on the user experience of the products that you are building, the solutions that you are providing, how best uh, with the best user experience you can uh, provide it to the end user. Uh, so then to talk about personas, I would like to also talk about uh, personas a little bit. So it's a very famous saying that if you try to please everyone, you'll end up pleasing no one. So it's very important to clearly distinguish who the end user will be. Will it be a business user who will just use the results of, uh, of uh, your solution? So for example, in case of predictions, will it be an end user getting the actions that, you know, a certain on a certain prediction, for example, in order to cash process, 
this order will not be delivered to your customer in time. These are the actions you should take, et cetera. So is it a business user or is it a machine learning engineer where they have they need more flexibility in terms of how to tune a machine learning model, what input they want to do to compare different machine learning models with each other to see to select one of them. Or if uh, it's a citizen developer who has a little bit of coding knowledge versus a little bit of business knowledge. So it's very important to clearly know the line between the business knowledge of your end user and the technical knowledge of your end user so that you develop the right abstraction of the solution. Uh, because what, uh, what happens often is that um, there are often these machine learning solutions that are trying to pro put a user interface on top of how to build a machine learning model. So they kind of abstract away the flexibility. So they give you a UI to create a new machine learning model. And what happens in the end is that for the business users, it's still very complicated to use because they don't have enough machine learning knowledge versus for the data scientists, it's very simple and they need a lot more flexibility. So in the end, this doesn't get a lot of usage. So it's very important to separate these personas and then build uh, the products focused on one of them separately. Then talking about solution feasibility, uh, there are a few things that you should look out for. So first of all, generalizability, because um, when we talk about products, we should think about how the same thing will be used for the benefit of multiple customers, right? So often the machine learning solution, so if you are working on a prediction use case or uh, some forecast, they're often very much catered to a single customer because it's like very much tuned to the data of a single customer. And you have to realize that when you're working on a product, you have to find this line between how much of it is generalizable and can be applied to many customers versus how much of it has to be customized for each customer uh, to see if you would be able to reach to a product uh, with that. And this also covers the aspect of scalability that can I scale it to many uh, customers uh, or is it like too much custom effort to provide it to a second customer or a third customer and how to make it distributable. And then it's very important to also think about how important it is uh, for the customer to have explainability uh, because machine learning solutions are often black box. And once you say, once you predict something or once you detect something, it's hard for an operational user to trust it because uh, it doesn't provide any background on why it's saying that. And uh, it's very important to understand how much it is important for, the end, for your end user and then try to add the explainability based on the data that they use day to day and enhance your solution with that. And obviously accuracy to know how accurate the re results can get with the data available. And uh, uh, if that accuracy level is good enough for the use case that you are covering or if it's a critical one and you won't be successful uh, if it's that accurate. And then obviously focus on how you will provide a good product experience as well, uh, giving the solution. And you also need to know your limits. So basically what data you have available, is it enough or uh, is it not enough? Uh, the size of the data and the quality of the data versus what value will you bring um, depending on the effort you are putting. Uh, you have to know if you need online solution or offline solution, for example, if you need the results really fast versus if it, it's okay to run it overnight and then you have to balance it with the speed of your solutions, as well as uh, you have to know the skill set of your marketing and sales team and you have to align the solutions that you are building with what your sales team can sell because machine learning is a rather more complicated topic. So you have to make sure that the sales team that you have is equipped to, to talk about those things and you have to go um, uh, to the level where uh, your uh, sales team have the same skill set to do so. 
Then moving towards communication. So when talking to uh, stakeholders, it's always nice to communicate your solution together with the relevant use cases because otherwise they don't understand where they can use it. For example, if I say that, okay, we, we built this solution that will help you predict, they don't know what to do with it. But if we enhance it with some templates saying, okay, so we have this uh, solution, you can do on-time delivery prediction with it, you can do late payment prediction with it, so map it with certain business um, statements, and then it would be much easier for your sales team to sell it, but also for your customers to understand it and think about other uh, places where they can use your solution. So it's very important also to know your audience of uh, what kind of knowledge they have in terms of business and technology so that you talk to them accordingly. And uh, you also have to be very careful on what you promise because machine learning is a uh, very wide uh, it has a very wide scope and your sales teams and even you and even customers, they often get like the wrong idea that everything is possible with it, or uh, you can pretty much do everything. Or when you are giving a machine learning model to a customer, and then if something is not predicting accurately, then it could lead to dissatisfaction. So you have to be very clear on what it can, but also what it cannot do. So this you have to be careful about uh, not to end up with customer dis dissatisfaction. And the last thing that I would like to cover is the ethical aspect of it. So since machine learning is a heavily data-driven approach, it's very important to take care of the ethical aspects of it. So it's very important to know uh, and to take care that the data is sufficiently anonymized that you are using to train your models. Uh, the users are well informed about it. You also have to make sure that the data you are using does not have any biases. So it could have like that the data you are training your solutions on uh, is heavily biased towards one gender or towards one race. And depending on how critical uh, the topics are that you are working on, it's more and more important to make sure that you are not introducing any biases into your solutions. And then you also should be very transparent about how accurate the results that your solution is giving uh, so that the operational users or the end user know that um, how what should be their trust ratio on it and how should they take care of the inaccuracy so it's very important that this part is also transparent and yeah with that i think these are the main uh, things that i learned over time that are very important while working with the machine learning domain uh, in, in the product. With that, uh, thank you so much. And I would leave it to you uh, for any questions or, or any other open discussion. Great, thank you, Noor. Thank you so much for your very insightful presentation and from, for your advices. Uh, everyone, you're welcome to ask questions now, either verbally or you can also write them, for instance, in the Zoom chat or on YouTube and Facebook, and we will gladly transfer your, your question here and ask them to, to Noor. I, first of all, I, I would like to ask you, could you kindly give us an, an example? I mean, what, what we discussed before the meetings, an example on how you um, apply machine learning in practice? Mm -hmm. So I can give you an example from uh, my own company. So we are, we are currently working on two different personas. So what one persona that we work on is the data scientist. For them, we have developed machine learning workbench, which is an integrated development environment together with a Python library uh, that uh, provide all the APIs uh, for these users to get the data into the Python data frames, for example, whatever they want to use, and then the uh, relevant functions that they can use to build their own machine learning solutions using the data that we have in our product. Versus uh, targeting the business user, we have integrated like really specific use cases into, into our products. So for example, in the order to cash process, we have integrated on-time delivery prediction into our product. So what it does is that it runs every time the new data is arriving into the system. 
uh, in the order to cache process. It looks for all the orders that are open and then it predicts, okay, this order is going to be delayed or this order is going to be delivered on time. And then based on that, we uh, produce um, actions for the operational user that this order is not gonna be delivered on time. So maybe you wanna inform the customer, for example, to avoid dissatisfaction. And then we also have uh, similarly a late payment prediction in the accounts receivable domain, where we uh, do risk assessment of which payments are at risk to guide the employees accordingly on uh, which customers they should reach out to to get the uh, payments on time. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the example. Just wanted to, to know that we, uh, we think of uh, in practice how we can apply it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comment from Lior. Thank you, Noor, for sharing. And we also have uh, several questions. I would ask a question from YouTube first, uh, from Alon. How do you define success on researching the different models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say that, uh, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but how and I understood is, is that <clears throat> when we are working on a solution, how, how do we know that uh, which machine learning model is more successful or which should we select in the end for production? So what we do is that um, we basically uh, do benchmarking. So we try multiple approaches and uh, based on the test data, uh, we try to identify which solutions are working uh, the best. And also we do co-innovation uh, projects together with the customer. So we try to get like continuous feedback during these projects from the customer to understand um, better how the uh, solution is doing and where do we need improvements and uh, try to reach the target accuracy for, for the model. It, it really depends on use case to use case, I would say. So in some use cases, it's okay to have 70 or 65% accuracy even, but in some use cases, it's very important to have more than 90. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Noor, for the answer. And thank you, Alan, for the question. Another question from YouTube for, from Hendrik. Um, how is the role of a, as a PM with a machine learning team? Do you have a normal product backlog? How does that uh, one look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the role with the, uh, the role as product manager in the machine learning team is, I would say, quite similar to uh, the other product managers. So yes, you do have a, a pr product backlog where you have different feature requests or different, um, uh, yeah, different requests from the customers. But what is different is that uh, also the two things I mentioned is that you are working with machine learning engineers more than you work with software engineers. And there you have to make sure that they're involved um, in all the business discussions because they need to understand the data to the level that they can map it to the solution. And then also the development life cycle is quite different because you have to spend a lot of time in model refinement and model tuning. So you have to uh, plan your sprints, for example, accordingly, making sure that the, these things will also take quite some time and it's a very iterative approach. Uh, but in general, it's uh, normally uh, the backlog is normally similar. So whatever we want to integrate to the product next, we add it to the backlog. Great, thank you. One more question we have here directly on Zoom from Janusz. How did you go about identifying these use cases for machine learning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we do is basically we talk to our customers and we try to interview them and ask them what kind of problems or what kind of pain points they are uh, facing and what do they think uh, would bring value for them. Uh, and uh, by talking to multiple customers, uh, we then find different problems and we then prioritize the ones that we see are common between multiple customers because uh, since we wanna 
focus on product uh, rather than customer specific consultation. So we wanna pick uh, the use cases that we see um, are relevant for many customers. So in the end, it's like mostly to do a little bit of marketing, um, uh, market research, but mostly to, uh, to talk to your customers and understand what they are missing in the product and if, uh, if machine learning can solve their problems. Okay, thank you for the answer. And thank you, Janusz, for the question. Does anyone have a question you would like to ask Noor directly? Okay, until, until then we have a, a, another question from Mizami. What are the challenges you have to face as a woman in a male-centric industry? Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> so um, I would say that normally, like being a minority anywhere, I think it's a bit harder uh, uh, to, to get recognized. So it's sometimes... Um, uh, sometimes harder to be heard or harder to be uh, taken seriously, I would say, being uh, being a woman. But uh, in general, I have had a very nice team and very nice people around me who I'm working with. So uh, they make things a lot easier for me. But in general, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, overall, I think it's a, uh, yeah, sometimes you find some some challenges, but uh, if if you you are part of the right team, then it works well. Yes, true. I I can also subscribe, and yes, that's a, that's an interesting uh, question. Mm -hmm. And if we're moving away to more general topics for the moment. Do you have any advice for people that would like to, to pivot into this uh, machine learning PM role from various roles? So from product management or project management or from software? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I would say that uh, for the people who want to start as a product management in, in the machine learning domain or as a project management, it's uh, very important to learn a bit of, uh, I would say a bit of technical understanding of what machine learning can and cannot do because although it's as a product manager, not uh, your job to, uh, think about what would the solution look like technically, but rather what problems do we want to solve and how to provide the best user experience. But when you are focused on machine learning topic, or like if, if your company has specific machine learning teams with which are product focused, then you have to distinguish what uh, your team should and should not do because uh, also the machine learning engineers or data scientists are more expensive as well. So you have to make sure that the uh, solutions you are working on are the right ones to work on. Um, so yeah, I think I, I would say that it would be nice to get a basic understanding of um, machine learning and then do a bit of market research of how, what different companies are doing out there uh, with machine learning to, to st I think that would be a good start to know what kind of products you would want to work on. Great, thank you, thank you so much. And if anyone has further questions, please also ask them verbally. We also have a, a further question from, from Janusz. Thank you very much, Janusz. How do you balance risky research heavy project versus more feasible use cases? Have you had any failures yet where you didn't achieve necessary accuracy? How to deal with it given the high cost for the ML research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. So, uh, uh, so far uh, we do not have a 
uh, a heavily research focused team, but we are mostly uh, working on more feasible use cases, let's say. So the use cases that we see are relevant for our users, the business users, and we kind of have a somewhat surety that they this is what they need and uh, uh, how the solution would look like. However, we have thought about it uh, to uh, also focus on research projects more because that's where innovation comes from. And so far, how what we thought about it is that we would like to um, reserve uh, 30% of the time of the team on the research projects so that we can also um, move towards state of the art uh, technologies and see uh, or experiment a bit more because uh, uh, up till now we are mostly like, let's say business driven rather than research uh, driven. So yeah, like so far our, my suggestion or our suggestion here would be to um, see what the company can spend on the research and based on that set a certain percentage of the team for the research projects. We also do uh, collaboration with academic. Uh, um, um, so we have this academic alliance at Salonis. So we also do uh, collaborations with university students and uh, research centers. So there we also then uh, most of the research focused uh, solutions are normally then together with them and they are mostly focusing on on that for us and then there is the second part of the question about failures um, so yes uh, it does happen that we have um, it, it did happen multiple times that we have worked on towards a solution that in the end we found out that it's not uh, feasible to scale it or it's not feasible because the accuracy is not good enough. And um, yeah, this normally helps you learn more, I would say, because it's kind of like uh, helps you go in the uh, right direction. So I, I call it evolution of the product, right? So I, we don't like, let's say completely dispose of a solution, but rather create the version two or version three of it, which is like the next generation uh, solution for it. So we have done that uh, a lot uh, because also not just because of accuracy, but also because of uh, the persona topic that I talked about that sometimes you end up with solutions, especially when working with machine learnings that are really complicated for the end user and then they are not adopted. So you have to then slowly um, evolve these solutions to simpler um, solutions, basically to for the customers to be able to use it. Great, thank you. Thank you, very interesting. And we already have a, a, another question from Usama. Is it a is it a problem that machine learning engineers have to spend quite a bit of time on software development, which they might not find very interesting, rather than the machine learning part? And how to deal with this scenario? Yeah, so it's always, uh, <laughs> I can totally understand the problem because I, I see that the machine learning engineers do not enjoy when it comes to productionizing or when it comes to talking about best practices of uh, in the software world. But uh, in order to like, first of all, I think it's always a good idea for the machine learning engineers to spend a bit of time on that uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, a good thing to do and consider while working on any, any products, but um, but how to deal with the scenario is then it's always a good idea to also have a, a one or two full stack developers or software engineers in the team. So that can support with the productionizing, with the infrastructure and uh, help the machine learning engineers uh, do those, uh, those tasks so that they can focus on, um, on the machine learning part that they enjoy the most. Great, thank you. For the answer, thank you for the question, Usama. Any further questions? You're also welcome to unmute yourself and we can talk directly. Hi, uh, this is Altaf Khan. 
Anna, um, I, I have a comment. Uh, something that Noor mentioned earlier that uh, if you want to solve something using machine learning, uh, you should only try to address those problems for which other solutions do not exist. So it should be the solution for last resort. But recently we've learned something uh, which I want to share that sometimes uh, when you try to solve a problem using traditional ways, it takes a long time to solve them. Uh, and uh, machine learning solutions many times can give you an answer you know, overnight. So if, if you are in a hurry to, to form a solution, uh, machine learning can be helpful. And uh, mm -hmm. another uh, exception is when uh, sometimes we, we have traditional solutions, and, but they're too complicated, they're not fast enough. So in those cases as well, uh, sometimes machine learning solutions can be more uh, performant uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, speed or sometimes in terms of power consumption. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the, the main idea is, is uh, uh, very well known that uh, it should be, machine learning should really be the solution of last resort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree uh, with what you said. And I, I think it's always the question of value versus effort, right? So it's always the question of if you are applying a machine learning solution here, what are the reasons, right? Is it just for the sake of saying that we have a machine learning solution versus, for example, a couple of things that you mentioned are like also a good reason to go for the machine learning solution, but you just have to have this argument and then you can um, basically um, decide on it, uh, uh, saying that, okay, these are the factors that is why ML would bring more value than a gen generic other solution. Thank you. Thank you for the insights, Altaf, and of course, Noor. Any, any further insights, comments, questions? opinions otherwise i i suggest we end the streaming part of our event and we continue together on zoom with the networking session so thank you very much noor for sharing this uh these insights with us for explaining uh such a complex topic in a very well structured way and giving us examples and answering all the questions it's very kind of you and we're very happy to have you here and thank you everyone from youtube and from facebook for being together with us and you're kindly invited now to join us on zoom we will post the links so please uh, follow the links and join us here for the networking session and we also gladly invite everyone to the next week's event, the same place and time, when we will talk about more interesting product management topics. So see you on Zoom, everyone now, and uh, 